My name is Richard Sluzes. I'm an Associate Professor of Urban Planning at the University of Twente in the Netherlands. And this lecture is going to be about the implications of geospatial technologies for slum mapping. I'm going to start first by talking about the nature of slums and give a couple of examples of different types of slum maps. Then I'll look at the technology and then I'll look at who's making the maps and how these are being made. Now the nature of slums and slum dwellers was actually discussed by an expert group meeting in, by, organised by UN Habitat in 2002 and it came up with sort of five main indicators, issues, which can be used to define who a slum dweller is. Adequate water, adequate sanitation, sufficient living space, secure tenure and durable housing. But when we think about slums, what we're actually thinking about are spatial concentrations of slum dwellers. And these take place in different contexts with different characteristics. So you can see here on these slides four different situations from Uganda, from Kenya, from Egypt and India, all having a different morphology with different building materials, uh, and different densities and types, as types of housing. Uh, so when we're mapping, we have to take cognizance of these differences. So when we're mapping, we're actually interested on, the, uh, particularly on the physical nature of slums. So we're interested in the morphological characteristics of slum, slum areas and how they differ from planned areas. So we're interested in characteristics like the size of the buildings, the density of the buildings and the patterns which we can see on an image. Patterns which relate to the density and the degree of order or, a, or a structure in a particular urban area. Slum mapping can be carried out at various spatial scales as well. We can have city-wide uh, surveys where we're particularly interested in uh, identifying and locating the slum areas and perhaps if we're able to monitor the, the slums by doing repeated surveys over time to study patterns of expansion and densification. We can also do large-scale mapping where the interest is in a particular settlement perhaps and the plots within that settlement. So here we see an example from Tanzania where the Ministry of Lands, Housing and Urban Development has undertaken some uh, a mapping of an informal settlement identifying roads, identifying parcels and allocating numbers to those parcels, so doing a land registration process and then connecting those parcels to their owners in such a way that titles or residential licences could be issued. So what I'd like to do now is to look at some of the major trends in geospatial technologies and I'll start first by looking at the platforms that are being used and these range from terrestrial devices such as handheld GPSs, smartphones and traditional surveying equipment through aerial photography these days typically digital aerial photography, satellite based systems and even unmanned aerial vehicles, an example of which you can see in the middle of this slide. Another trend in geospatial technologies is the increasing spatial, spectral and temporal resolutions of the images and data which is being captured. So here we see, for example, a Worldview image which was produced by the Worldview 2 satellite in 2009. In 2014, the next version, next generation uh, Worldview satellite was launched with even higher resolution, more bands and a higher return rate. So it's now possible to collect imagery, theoretically at least, every day for the same piece of the Earth's surface. Using unmanned aerial vehicle imagery on the other hand provides an opportunity to create ultra high resolution imagery of maybe five centimetres or so over relatively small areas. So this is ideal for a situation where you might want to map just one particular settlement, say for a land registration project or for a settlement upgrading project. Now this imagery was recently collected in Namibia and as you see when you zoom in it's extremely high, highly detailed. You can see the individual people walking on the street, you can see the rubbish lying on the, on the, on the surface, you can see the fences etc. But more than that it's possible to use this technology to actually generate highly accurate, highly detailed two and three dimensional models of the area in such a way that you can actually use the model for doing detailed runoff analysis, for example, if this was an unplanned area, for example, which had a flooding problem and you wanted to plan the, the drainage system in a better way. Such imagery would be of extremely uh, high value. The last trend in geospatial technology I want to mention in this lecture is about open data and software. We see an increasing availability of open data. This is promoted by groups such as the Group on Earth Observation, but also many, other, many countries are making certain types of imagery now available, freely available to anybody who wants to use them and has the capacity to use them. We see internet platforms for the access to data and maps, OpenStreetMaps, Google Maps, 
India's Bhuvan server and many others are available. We see numerous open source software packages for handling geospatial information, QGIS, EOS, GRASS, and many others as well. And we see also advanced methods for data, data fusion, dense image matching, and other methods to improve data e extraction and the quality of data which is being extracted. Let's move now and think about who, who the slum mappers actually are. And I've identified four broad communities, two of which are professional. There's the professional public agencies who are making, producing data and m providing mapping services. And we have commercial data providers as well. And in addition, we have academic researchers who are primarily interested in developing new technologies and methods for mapping and including that in, in that as well, slum mapping. And we have the NGO CBO communities who are very much involved in participatory approaches and the empowerment of, these, uh, of the slum dwellers themselves. In the lecture, I'm going to concentrate only on the last two and I'll give a few examples of what's going on at present in these areas. In the research domain, what we see is a move from pixel-based analysis of imagery to object-based image extraction. And in relation to slum mapping, an ontological approach has been developed uh, by Divyani Kohli and some colleagues, myself included, which is essentially trying to identify different types of objects from an image. We have to base objects, the buildings and the roads and other detailed features. We have the settlements, so you could say the slum settlement as an entity or object. And we're interested in its shape, its degree of order, spatial order, its density and things like that. And we have the environs of the settlement where we're interested in its location and the neighborhood characteristics. So what we try to do with geographic uh, object-based image analysis is actually the first thing is to segment the image into chunks or segments which are somehow homogeneous in terms of their spectral and spatial properties. These can then be classified as we see here on the right in this case showing they are classified into buildings and these buildings can then be further analysed in terms of their shape properties, sizes, etc. And then aggregated up to a higher, higher spatial level such as the settlement. Now we've been working on this in a number of contexts. Here I'm showing a slide just of, uh, of one application in the city of Pune in India. The results are mixed so far. We, we're getting an overall accuracy of about 80 to 85 percent in terms of our ability to identify slums with the current methods. Um, it works particularly well in some areas as we see in the top of these images, but in the city centre, which is an historic city centre in the case of Pune, there's a lot of confusion between simply old neighbourhoods and slum areas. Now this doesn't mean that the results are, are useless, it just means that it just shows the importance of having local knowledge to make actual judgments about what is correct and what is incorrect when you're doing this type of image analysis. If you move to participatory slum mapping on the other hand, it's, it's actually incorporating, it's built if you like on local knowledge and that makes it extremely powerful. In the case of Kampala, Shack Slum Dwellers International has been working together with Act Together and other local NGOs to produce a slum profile of the city. This provides maps but it also generates statistics and this example is actually already, you can find out more about it by looking at the lecture of Sheila Patel which was recorded also in this series. This data from Kampala is going to be made available together with data from other participating cities. So access to slum data will be, will be gradually improving over time as, as further studies are carried out. Another good example is Map Kibera project where residents armed with GPSs were, went out and mapped the streets of their community which was otherwise poorly mapped. And in addition to mapping the streets, they also located the important community facilities, water points, health centres and those types of uh, facilities. But it's not only NGOs and CBOs that use participatory approaches. Governments too can also do it. Uh, in Cairo, GTZ uh, helped the Egyptian government and the governorates of Cairo to work together and build an information database based on imagery which also made use of participatory approaches and it enabled them to map over a period of time, over 50 years, to show how informal settlements had expanded in the city and then to target those settlements which were particularly in need of attention, making more detailed maps in the process such as the map we see here in Manshid Nasser which was used for upgrading of that settlement. So in summing up, what all of these examples are showing is that there's an enormous range of developments in geospatial technologies that create many, many opportunities for slum mapping and for slum mappers to, 
um, to become involved. We have automatic slum identification and delineation for characterizing uh, slums in different contexts. This is a rapidly developing research field, but it's not yet fully operational. But watch this space. It will get better and better as time goes on. And perhaps within five years, we will have operational tools. Perhaps the more important than the technological issues, though, are the social and institutional issues related to slum mapping. Governments have the power to recognize and legitimize community-based slum mapping, or to reject it, and as well to open their spatial databases to their citizens. Now, these choices are crucial to engage citizens as partners in urban planning and management. It's also important to realise that mapping and slum mapping is not a one-off exercise. Slums change rapidly, so we need to create and maintain the data on slums. Think in terms also not of just of maps, but think in terms of databases, databases which can be used to monitor and analyse the development process as it happens in cities. And building the knowledge and capacity and actions are more important perhaps than actual the geospatial technologies and the maps themselves. Thank you very much.